Hello, my name is Zizel Slipovich, and I'm a musician in residence at Yale University's Fortune of Video Archive for Holocaust Testimonies. This video series is designed as a companion to our album Where is Our Homeland, which is the first volume in the archive's ongoing effort to present songs and poems performed by survivors in testimonies given to the Fortune of Archive over the last 40 years. You can learn more about the project on the archive's website, songsfromtestimonies.org. Where is Our Homeland? Songs from Testimonies Volume 1 was recorded in 2019 by the Zizel Slepovich Ensemble featuring renowned singer Sasha Luria, Craig Udelman on the violin, Joshua Camp on the accordion, keyboards and guitar, Dmitry Ishenko on the bass and myself on woodwinds. The songs in this collection differ vastly in terms of style, social and historical background, language and many other aspects, but collectively they create a multidimensional picture of Jewish life before and during World War II. Irene S. was born in 1925 in Berezhany, or Berezhany in Galicia, now Ukraine, and was raised in Grudziądz, Poland. Irene was the prisoner of the Bialystok ghetto and later of several concentration camps, including Majdanek, Treblinka and Auschwitz. Irene was a slave laborer in Germany and was liberated by the Americans in Kaunitz. By the time the war broke out, Irene was an accomplished singer-songwriter. In her testimony, she recalls singing existing songs and composing new ones together with her young fellow prisoners from Poland and the Soviet Union. While Irene's native language was Polish, she co-wrote this song with a Russian-speaking boy as they were transported from Bialystok ghetto to Majdanek by the way of Treblinka. The song manifesto of the enslaved children was created in the genre of the heroic military march in the minor key, which was quite typical for the protest and resistance songs of the era. It's, uh, oh, I don't know if I could uh, sing it now. Just try. Военные грузы весь мир обнимают, И льется рабочая кровь. Вчерашние дети свободного края, Сегодня мы плеем я рабов. This is just a verse, and uh, what does it mean? <coughs> this is in Russian. That uh, a, a worldwide storm is embracing this world, and uh, people's blood is being shed all all over. And yesterday's free children, we're today's. We're today's. Uh, war prisoners, prisoners of war, or we're today's slaves, really, the best translation is we're t today we are a bunch of slaves. And it goes on, uh, we are we're broke, we are kept apart from the rest of the world and uh, locked in this ghetto. And we are beaten with a Nazi stick but if today life is bad for us, we are still hoping for a better tomorrow. Well, all of those songs were always like this. <laughs> no, uh, uh, can, can you sing that part about the hope that you had? Zakritimi vieto atorvani at mira i biti nazistim knutom. Но если сегодня жить тяжко и плохо, сегодня мы завтра ждем. Но если сегодня жить тяжко и плохо, мы лучше завтра пождем. The reason for which it was written, written in Russian was that the boy who wrote the words didn't speak any Yiddish. And so we had a choice of Polish or Russian, so we wrote it in Russian. Вчерашние дети 
свободного края Сегодня мы племя рабов Вчерашние дети свободного края Сегодня мы племя рабов Закрыты мы в гетто, оторваны от мира И биты нацистским кнутом Но если сегодня жить тяжко и плохо Сегодня мы завтра подождем Но если сегодня жить тяжко и плохо Мы лучшего завтра подождем Many people, when they think of the ghettos in Eastern Europe, mistakenly regard them as being only uh, holding pens for the death camps or antechambers to the concentration camps. But in fact, these ghettos were still uh, communities in their own right. Uh, on the one hand, uh, they were still shaped uh, to some degree or other by pre-war values, by pre-war memories, by pre-war social customs and relationships. And on the other hand, they were dealing with unprecedented uh, oppression. Now, in the pre-war communities, the Jews had newspapers, they had radio, uh, in the ghettos, uh, access to these forms of social interaction and communication were terribly limited. And what took their place to a very large degree were songs. And singing became a basic uh, uh, a medium, a, a basic uh, a type of ghetto interaction. Street singers were very popular. Just take a look at Yanka Lehershovich in the Lodge ghetto. Uh, people sang uh, together. Uh, singing together expressed hopes, fears. They expressed the trauma of loss. If you lost a child or a husband, uh, a song could uh, 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 not only express your own uh, uh, injury, your, your own hurt, but the people who were singing that song with you let you know that they've suffered uh, the same loss and they are experiencing what you're experiencing. One of the key features of, of ghetto life was the constant contraction of the distance between the individual and the collective. What happens to me in the ghetto will probably happen to us. And what happens to us will probably happen to me. There were different kinds of ghetto songs. Uh, one a very common kind of ghetto song was the inverted uh, pre-war lullaby or folk song. A, uh, tune that everybody knew, a lullaby that everybody remembered, uh, would be sung, but with different words, uh, expressing the stark contrast between the before and the now. Uh, a lullaby like Rajin Kesmit Mandlin, Raisins and Almonds, which mothers would sing to their children, uh, hoping that they would grow up to be not only learned in Torah, but a, a proficient and wealthy merchant. Uh, lullabies which talk about how daddy is going to come home and he is going to bring gifts for all of us. These words were now changed to express the fact that what, what we have now is, uh, uh, is, is absolutely uh, different from what we used to have. Uh, 
in one lullaby in the Lodge ghetto, the words are Nishkein Rojinkes, Nishkein Manlin, Daltati is Nishkifo and Hanlin. We don't have raisins, we don't have almonds. Our father did not go out to trade. In fact, our father is gone. We may never see him again. So this was one kind of ghetto song. Then there were beggar songs in the Warsaw ghetto, for example. Ich gib nicht auf die Bonne. I'm not giving up my ration card. I want to survive. There were parodies, uh, uh, sarcastic uh, criticisms of the Judenrat and the Jewish police. In the Vilna ghetto especially, uh, many of the songs were connected to the cabaret and the theater. The Vilna ghetto was, had many gifted songwriters like uh, Kasriel Breide and Leib Rosenthal. And uh, the cabaret, the ghetto theater were very, very popular. And some of these songs uh, ver were very quickly picked up by everybody. A song like Moshe Halzech, sung to an American ragtime beat, expressing the hope that you got to get out of here. It's going to change. Just hold on. Don't get depressed. A song like Pesha von Resha. Pesha is a 17-year-old girl. She's lost her parents, but uh, she's not going to give up hope. She can uh, find her way any, anywhere. She's not going to let herself uh, get depressed. There's a song, Yis Yisrolik, about a tough little kid who's lost his mommy and daddy, but nonetheless, nobody's going to push him around. And then finally, we have the kind of song that Irene Shapiro wrote. These are what I would call part of the general genre of partisan songs. They radiate defiance and resistance. Uh, they stress the, con the contrast between the ghetto today and a better life uh, tomorrow. Uh, these are not songs of despair or, or nostalgia. They're not particularly Jewish. Uh, instead, they seek to leap over the walls that separate Jews from non-Jews and reiterate faith in a better world after the war is uh, over. And it also reminds us something that is very often forgotten that in the war, the USSR for Jews in the East European ghettos was in fact the only hope. Great Britain had betrayed the Jews with the white paper, uh, uh, ending its promises to the Zionist movement. This happened in 1939. Uh, the United States was indifferent. Uh, and there was a natural desire to think that uh, the Red Army would come in time to liberate them. There was a natural hope that Stalin, the great leader, uh, would emerge as the only person in the world who could defeat the Nazi war machine. You could argue that this was engaging in illusions and wishful thinking, but what other choice did they have? Now, Irene Shapiro herself is an amazing woman. Uh, her family came from East Galicia, which was a mixed Polish, Ukrainian, and Jewish area. But they moved to uh, Grudziądz, a town in northwestern Poland near Gdansk, or Danzig, uh, and that's where she grew up. It was a town with a large Jewish uh, and uh, it was a town with a large German population where there were very few Jews. She did not grow up speaking Yiddish. She grew up speaking uh, Polish. Her father was a respected music teacher. Uh, by all accounts, it was a very uh, happy family, but with the rising tide of Nazism among the local Germans, uh, the family pulled up stakes and moved to Bialystok in 1938. Bialystok was a very different kind of community. 
It was uh, uh, a uh, city where the Jews were a majority of the population, where the Jews spoke mainly Yiddish, uh, but the family seems to have landed on its feet. Her father was able to pick up his uh, career as a, a, as a uh, teacher. And uh, after a short German occupation in September 1939, Bialystok uh, was taken over by the Soviets until June 1941, when the Germans invaded the Soviet Union. And Irene Shapiro and her parents and her sister found themselves in the Bialystok ghetto. The horrors of the German occupation began literally the first day that the Germans came. Uh, 2,000 Jews were herded into a synagogue and burned alive. Thousands of Jewish men were uh, shanghaied off the streets and uh, shot. Uh, after the first wave of terror subsided, uh, a Bialystok ghetto was established, which uh, provided a period of relative stability until February 1943. As ghettos go, the Bialystok ghetto was not terrible. The Judenrat uh, enjoyed the respect of most of the Jewish population. It was led by a uh, engineer, Ephraim Barash, who did the best he could to make sure that people didn't starve, that they didn't die of ap uh, epidemics. He set up many shops and enterprises, and he deluded himself into thinking that this work for the Germans might buy time and save uh, the ghetto. There was also a resistance movement in the Bialystok ghetto led by Mordechai Tannenbaum, and uh, this uh, resistance movement in fact had uh, clear uh, ties to uh, the Judenrat. Uh, Barash gave them money to buy weapons. Uh, Barash had frequent conversations with uh, Tannenbaum, and uh, uh, the uh, Judenrat simply asked the resistance movement not to do anything that might give the Germans an excuse to liquidate uh, the ghetto. And Irene Shapiro was part of that resistance organization. Uh, and uh, she was uh, determined to go to the forests and fight as a partisan. But before that happened, the Germans pounced in August 1943, the second major uh, action in the Bialystok ghetto. And without informing Barash, they began to deport all the Jews. The resistance movement was taken totally by surprise and they were determined to fight. Now, when this happened, uh, it turned out that unlike the Warsaw Ghetto, where the Jews supported the fighters, where the Jews built 750 bunkers, uh, in fact, it was the civilian support for the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto, the hundreds of bunkers the Jews built, which enabled the uprising to last for 30 days. In Bialystok, none of this happened. The uh, young people who were in the resistance were totally isolated. Uh, the Jews did not support them. Uh, they, in fact, believed in German promises that they would be sent to work. And Irene Shapiro found herself holding a grenade and not knowing what to do with it. Uh, and a German soldier actually comes over, gently takes the grenade from her hand and sends her over to her mother and father who are waiting to be loaded onto a train. Some other young people fight back but within a day, the resistance in the Bialystok ghetto is stamped out. The train that the Germans put Irene Shapiro's family on is divided into two sections. One section uh, is detached uh, when the train comes to Treblinka and the Jews there are, are gassed. In fact, this was the last killing in uh, Treblinka in mid-August 1943 
uh, two weeks after the Treblinka uprising. And once these Bialystok Jews were killed, uh, the camp was uh, dissolved. The cars that Irene Shapiro uh, uh, happened to be in went to Majdanek. And uh, Irene Shapiro and her mother were separated from their father. Uh, they, were, uh, uh, they went through all the horrors of Majdanek, but luckily they were deported to another labor camp before all the Jews in Majdanek were killed in November 1943. Irene Shapiro survived these uh, uh, labor camps, lived to see the liberation, uh, and then made a life for herself in the United States as uh, a teacher in Bronx High School of uh, Science, and she also had a family. The, the song that she wrote uh, is written in Russian. It's not written in uh, Yiddish. Uh, Yiddish was not Irene Shapiro's native language, but Russian wasn't either. And again, I think it shows this uh, uh, desire, this, this uh, uh, tendency to uh, put one's hopes in the uh, power of the Soviet Union. I want to end this uh, talk by saying that we should judge this song not by its literary or its musical merit, because it doesn't have a lot of literary merit, and the song is simply uh, the kind of tune that you could hear in any Soviet wartime movie. Uh, but we should judge this song by another criterion. It's an example of spiritual and cultural resistance in the widest sense of the term, that when the Germans try to crush you, when the Germans try to reduce you to a person without agency, without hope, without initiative, Singing is one way to fight back, to say no matter where I am and no matter how terrible my situation might be, I can still sing, I can still write. And that reminds me that on one level, at least, I'm still a human being. Thank you. Mm -hmm.